Over team radio throughout a race and in all the technical aftertalk, we hear a lot about engine maps and modes that drivers often change and fiddle with either independently or at the behest of their engineers. So what is engine mapping and how does it affect the way the cars perform? Let's start with the basics. In the way back when, and I mean way back when, the accelerator pedal was directly physically connected to the engine via a mechanical cable. The more you pushed your foot to the pedal, the more the throttle opened, letting more air and fuel into the engine cylinders, which drove more power from the engine via increased combustion. It was simple, but limited. Now the amount of travel in the accelerator pedal is measured electronically and read by the Electronic Control Unit, or ECU. The ECU then takes in lots of other inputs from the car and works out exactly how to manage the combustion part of the engine and ultimately the power output. It works all this out via engine maps. Engine maps are essentially a bunch of data tables in which the ECU looks up what's going on with the car and driver inputs and find out what it's supposed to do with the engine. To get a feel for this, let's start with the engine torque map, which is really more of a lay of the land than a series of instructions, but it all fits into the wider picture. You'll see. The engine torque map just describes how much torque the engine delivers as standard at a given RPM and amount of throttle. The RPM, that's the rotational speed of the engine, and throttle level, that's basically how much fuel mixture you're pumping into the engine, are your inputs. The torque, which is strictly how much turning force the engine is producing, is an output. So if you know your RPM and throttle level, the map will tell you the engine torque. So let's imagine a very simple scaled down version of this engine map. We can model it to see what would happen at slow, medium and fast RPMs, and we can also look at narrow, medium and full throttle levels. This gives us a nice table with nine possible scenarios, our outputs. So if the engine is running at low RPM and we're only squeezing the throttle a little, the map tells us the engine will be producing a small amount of torque. Full throttle at high RPM produces a large amount of torque, and so on. We just draw from the two inputs to find our output torque. You get the idea. Now obviously the engine map used in real life is a lot more granular than that, using more than just our three gradations of input, but this one looks a lot more daunting than our one at first glance. So really this engine torque map just describes the engine as it normally behaves. We can gather this data by running the engine on a testing dyno and logging its torque levels on the different scenarios. But what if we wanted to create a map that did make it behave differently to normal. This is where our custom various engine mappings come in. We can create our own versions of this map so that when a driver pushes the accelerator pedal at a certain engine speed, the torque outputted will be different under different maps. For example, we might want to lower the torque at lower revs like this, or we may want to make the jump from low to high torque more dramatic. The idea behind these maps is that we're going to demand from the engine a certain amount of torque or power given certain scenario. We're going to tell the engine, if I'm pushing the throttle halfway and you're revving at 8000 RPM, then you better give me 180 newton meters of torque or whatever. This engine map is sometimes referred to aptly as the driver demand torque map, as the driver demands a certain output from the engine by applying the throttle pedal. Let's simplify this again by taking engine speed out of the equation for a second so we can think about what engine maps might mean to the driver. So instead, let's just think about the relationship between the accelerator pedal and the torque out of the engine. So you're the driver and when you adjust the pedal with your foot, you'll have an expectation of what the engine does, what kind of power gets delivered to the rear wheels. Let's do a little graph showing how far the accelerator pedal is pushed down along the bottom and how much torque the engine is giving you up the side. Now the rules state that 0% and 100% throttle must translate to 0% and 100% of the available torque respectively, so that's here and here. We could draw a straight line between these points to create a linear relationship, and that would mean 50% throttle produces 50% torque, 27% throttle produces 27% torque, and so on like that. And you might think, cool, that makes sense. If I'm a driver, that would be incredibly intuitive to me. I'd know exactly where I am with that. But consider this, if you're accelerating out of a slow corner, you've really got to be careful of wheel spin. It slows you down and it wears the tyres. And this happens if you whack too much torque into the tyres. So you might want the pedal to be more delicate at first, with each centimetre of travel in the pedal, producing a smaller change in the torque so you can manage more finely a smooth increase in torque at lower speeds. So the engine map would have a shallower graph at first, with maybe the first 30% of pedal travel giving you just 10% of the engine torque. This is one of many scenarios that feed into the driver demand torque map. You'll probably have one map that's suited for wet weather, where again, wheel spin is a big problem, even at high speeds. You might have ones that are more or less power intensive, depending on whether you're going full beans in qualifying or pacing yourself in the middle of a race. 
Your maps will even vary from track to track, with a slow, tight circuit like Monaco requiring a very different feel to, say, a high-speed circuit like Spa-Francorchamps that requires far less fiddling about in slow corners and much more control at high speeds and high revs. A big part of this is about driver feel. Which mapping helps the driver deliver just the power they need in the way they like to use the accelerator? Two drivers in the same team on the same track might finesse their engine maps in different ways throughout practice. If you, the viewer, are a driver, you should understand this, though it may have become subconsciously intuitive by now. When you use the accelerator pedal, you have a sense of how the car is going to behave. You know how it feels at different RPM and pedal travels. Incidentally, there are limitations on how you can build your engine maps. You need to submit them to the FIA, who'll check you aren't veering too close to traction control or launch control. You can see how the art of managing errant wheel spin through a computer is a little bit traction controlly. So, does the ECU then get the engine to deliver the torque demanded by the driver? Well, it uses a number of other maps to deliver inputs into the actual mechanics of the engine to deliver the demanded torque, particularly the ignition timing map and the injector timing map. These two maps are essentially just tables again that tell the engine when to fire the spark plug and how much fuel to deliver into the cylinder by looking at the engine speed or RPM and the amount of torque currently working the engine. We're not going into the whole mechanics of a combustion engine here, but essentially engine power comes from a mixture of air and fuel being injected into the cylinders and a spark plug igniting to flash combust that fuel mix into driving the pistons. In the piston cycle of injection, compression, combustion and exhaustion, the exact timing of firing the spark plug, the ignition, and the amount of fuel delivered, the injection, can have quite the effect on the torque output of the engine. So via the ignition and ejection maps, the ECU looks at the driver demand map, it looks at the current state of the engine, it looks at other inputting factors like temperature, fuel mix, and works out the exact combustion settings to meet the torque demands. It sounds complicated, but it all happens incredibly smoothly. Now bear in mind, this is a different mechanism to the fuel mix settings, which you may know from Codemasters game for its lean, standard and rich mix settings. Now while you can map engines to work with fuel mixtures and lean into the trade-offs of efficiency, power and wear, that is a kettle of fish for another time. Let's check in on a few of your questions. Was the liveries video finished before Ferrari's cheeky Philip Morris branding? Um, actually, yes. Well, I was in the middle of making it when Ferrari announced their change in livery. I was so disappointed that they just stuck a rubbish logo on the engine cover and that was it. I assume Mission Winnow is a bottling facility. What was my favourite livery this year? Um, my favourite liveries tend to be ones that are changed on the previous year, executed really well. So I think the Sauber livery is really smart and I'm still in love with what Toro Rosso have been doing lately. But I think Renault have done something really nice this year. And Gianluca asks, what would happen if Toro Rosso didn't actually get a second driver? Well, if they turned up with only one car, the FIA would class them as having not properly turned up to a race. And if the FIA deems that you don't have the means to take part in the competition, your team is disqualified. Like from the whole championship. So Toro Rosso will shove Maldonado in there if they have to. Cool. See you next time.